Hello, good evening. My name is Carmen Julia and I'm curator at Spike Island. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event with Philip Barlow, Veronica Ryan and Francis Morris, who will be discussing different positions around sculpture. Today's conversation is part of an extended program of events organized around Veronica Ryan's exhibition, Along a Spectrum, currently on view in our galleries. The works in the exhibition were made during an artist's residency at Spike Island over the past two years. They explore the, the fragility of the natural environment and the psychological impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The exhibition is supported by Freelance Foundation through the Freelance Award. Before I introduce our guest tonight, I just want to say that our public programs seek to create an environment for critical and open-minded discussion. We encourage you to use the chat function available through YouTube Live to write any questions you may have throughout the event. We'll be fielding this around the 55 minute mark and please note that the live stream and the chat are being recorded. A reminder that any aggressive, discriminatory or intolerant comments will be removed by our chat moderators in keeping with our aims to create a respectful and generative environment for all involved. Please see our code of conduct for more information. This event includes live subtitles provided by Joan Petre from a stage text. And now without further delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers. Philly de Barlow was born in 1944 in Newcastle upon Tyne and graduated at the Slater School of Fine Art in 1966. She now lives and works in London. For more than 50 years, Barlow has been taking inspiration from her surroundings to create imposing installations that can be at once menacing and playful. The audience is challenged into a new relationship with the sculptural object, the gallery environment and the world beyond. Barlow's work has been exhibited extensively across institutions internationally. In 2017, she represented Britain at the Venice Biennial and a major solo exhibition of her work is currently in view at Haus der Kunst in Munich, Germany. Veronica Ryan was born in 1956 in Plymouth, Montserrat, and she currently works between New York and the UK. She is best known for her sculptural works that engage with issues of history, identity, dislocation, and belonging, and examine the psychological and semantics of perception. She graduated at the Slade School of Fine Art in 1980, and she has exhibited widely nationally and internationally. Her work is currently on view at the Hepworth Wakefield as part of a major retrospective exhibition of Barbara Hepworth and at the group show Portable Sculpture at the Henry Moore Institute. Ryan has been the recipient of numerous awards and prizes, including most recently the 2019 Freelance Award and the Hackney Art Windrush Commission to be unveiled this autumn. Francis Morris has been director of Tate Modern since 2016. Curator, writer, and broadcaster, Frances joined Tate in 1987, becoming head of this place at Tate Modern in 2000 and director of collections International Art from 2006. Alongside many exhibition projects and publications, including acclaimed retrospectives of Louise Bourgeois, Jajoy Kusama, and Agnes Martin, Frances has led the transformation of Tate's international collection strategically broadening and diversifying its international reach and representation, developing the collection of live art and performance and pioneering new forms of museum display. Welcome everyone, and thank you all for being here this evening. Francis, I hand over to you. Carmen, um, uh, thank you so much for your uh, kind words of introduction and for dealing with the stop-start technology so brilliantly, but I mean, for all of us living through lockdown, the stop start thing is um, something we're very familiar with. So we will carry on uh, regardless. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with Veronica and Philida, uh, two friends uh, from the art world. And I have to declare an interest, um, a passionate interest in both their works. Uh, Veronica, I met you, I think in 1987, that great show at Arnold Feeney. Um, I transitioned to Tate um, at the same time as your work entered Tate. Um, one of the early pleasures of my time at Tate was uh, helping just put your work on display uh, in the galleries at Millbank. Um, and amazingly, we've gone on being uh, 
in touch on an occasional basis ever since. And I'm thrilled uh, about uh, your recent success and uh, honored really to be invited to come and speak with you on this occasion. Philida, our history goes back not quite so far, but um, I had the, again, the honor, the pleasure to be able to write about your work uh, a number of years ago on the occasion of your exhibition at Fruit Market and uh, visited your studio. And I have to say visits to your studio and home over several weeks and Veronica, a visit to you in Fingering Ho, probably in 1988, uh, are amongst the sort of transformative experiences of my career because of course uh, curators uh, always stand on the sidelines it's it's our, our blessing but it's uh, also our, our curse and of course when we think about sculpture we never stop thinking about that phrase and Carmen says this in her introduction to Veronica's great catalogue what turns an idea into an object and after uh, 40 years as a curator, I still don't know, but I'm fascinated uh, by that journey. So um, you sort of have parallel lives. Uh, parallel lives. Uh, you've both been unbelievably productive during this period of closure. Um, Veronica with three great exhibition projects that uh, you know have really uh, revealed such uh, intense integrity and in sculptural work over the last few years and Philida, an extraordinary exhibition at Haus der Kunst, which I think you still have not seen in person. No, no, I haven't, no. <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> but you did it. Yeah. Uh, I but, and <laughs> on the way, you have both been honoured uh, by the nation, by our Queen, and I would like to congratulate you, but really the, the, the honouring is in, in the work and, and, the, and the public and critical acclaim that you have both received. And, I mean, I've spent many years at Tate juxtaposing objects and uh, in sort of conversation works of art. And tonight's a juxtaposition of two artists who have little in common and yet much in common because you uh, occupy the same space and the same era. And I just thought that I could prompt uh, a conversation between us by uh, working through a number of uh, thematics, some of which are really quite obvious. And I thought we would possibly start with a question of scale very obvious, um, Philida, your work is extraordinarily expansive. It spills out of buildings onto streets and um, <laughs> towers over people. Veronica, your work is minuscule, is handheld, is, 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 is are magical uh, uh, objects. Um, Veronica, tell us about that scale. Um. It's the, the scale is um, partly prompted by the fact that I carry work around in my uh, rucksack and my various bags quite a lot. And um, so that I could work anywhere uh, is one reason that they occupy a, a kind of minuscule scale. Um, in fact, at the slave, um, I was making quite large architectural structures which relate to um, at the time I was going to the British Museum and looking at pyramids and so I was making quite a lot of pyramidal kind of um, structures with wood. Um, it started to dawn on me that um, in order to carry on working once I left Slade, I needed to be able to make work without um, technicians or without machinery. And I think that might be one reason why the scale continued to be small. Um, because in fact, what happens is that I make, tend to make accumulations of small things, which then belong together. Yes, I mean, that's, that's so interesting. I was thinking about earlier today about the although uh, you know the, the, there is a kind of small handheld scale to their work, often when you, you in the placing of the works or the installation, actually they become a kind of, um, there's an almost a sort of archival, um, um, not duplication or replication, but they're kind of um, bringing together many objects in a, in, a, in a, so that the scale becomes a multiplicity of small parts. 
Um, I'm really interested in the idea of the small components um, existing in, in conversation with each other. Um, and so sometimes I have to be quite clear about which um, components belong together. Um, and, and that sometimes is um, more difficult to decide in a way. So I, I tend to group, because I tend to work on more than one piece or uh, component at any one given time, in the end, those are the components that end up being together. That, that happened contemporaneously. So there's a sort of yeah. index of yes. Yeah. Exactly. yes. Um, um, but sometimes um, I work over a number of years and, um, and one, one of the things I'm doing at the moment is trying to complete years and years of small parts um, in various spaces. Mm. So in, in West Beth, I've got lots of small parts that I'm bringing together. And then when I'm in England, I have work in various locations that come out um, of the been put away state. And then I continue um, working on, on those. So Veronica, I'm um, sorry, Veronica, um, you've spoken about the sort of the connection between scale and circumstance in a way. You know, you, you, the, there's a nomadic um, pattern to your career, you know, from England to America and back again, and now you're coming back and forwards. Um, Philida, I mean, the, the kind of circumstances of your life have also governed the, the, manner, the, the way in which your work has manifest and your studio practice, but, and you have made very expensive work, but there was a period where you, you also made small scale, um, you know, handheld objects too. Hmm. I, yes, I mean, I always have and I still do. I mean, I think what fascinates me about the small object is a sort of example that you could put a teacup in the middle of the Albert Hall and it would ping in a way that large objects don't. And I find this fascinating. You can go to Broadgate and you can say to somebody, have you seen the Franks, um, the Richard Serra there? And they say, no, where is it? There's a strange way in which very large things disappear. But I think what's so stunning about your show, Veronica, at Spike Island from the images is this, um, it, I don't know, for me, it's like something quite paradoxical happen where objects that, I would see, have an association with comfort of some sort, but they're kind of removed from the space of comfort and in a way get placed in isolation. So we, we given something and also have it kind of taken away from us. And I think that's an extraordinary experience that the small object can command that incredibly powerful. So, I mean, I haven't been there, but I, I forgive me. I, I'm just imagining what these things might do to me in the space. And I think that's something that large objects can't do. Mm. And maybe just to follow on from that, I have to say, I'm not actually that interested in large sculptures. <laughs> what I'm, I, I know that must seem, a deceit to say that but I think I'm interested in what the act of making when it's on the edge of risk and being out of control can can do in the context of a space or even a non-space an outside space and where that in a way first of all takes me and then secondly takes an audience and I think Oddly enough, the paradox within your intense small objects, which I see radiating this kind of warmth and comfort, but at the same time refusing, because of the way they're shown, almost refusing to offer that as well, perhaps even offering something a little bit hostile. 
<laughs> but their their actual reminiscences that they offer are so are the opposite. So we're balanced between the two. And I, I in a way think something of paradox is a territory we both share in some way. I, I don't know whether that makes any sense to you. <laughs> well, absolutely. Um, I, I remember the first time we met um, in Cambridge. Mm. You, you were doing a few some outside Kettle's Yard and I was doing that um, residency. Yes, yes, yes. And you were really friendly, came up and introduced yourself. And we've, we've had a kind of contact really, even if I haven't seen you yeah. regularly over a period of time, I always remember really liking the earlier work I saw of yours and, and having a sense of commonality, a kind of shared language um, that has continued to resonate. Um, I'm interested in that notion of something small. You just talked about something which looks as though it's, there's comfort there and, and the, the deceit. So one might seem to be engrossed with something which has a kind of beauty, but the beauty is, 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 is paradoxical in the sense that the more you investigate, that their kind of multiplicity of um, conversations occupying a small um, um, thing, um, but the thing it has these different layers of offerings. It isn't, one isn't just um, being confronted with, with one dimensional paradigm. And I, I'm interested in contradictions and something being able to offer different strands within, within its thingness. Do you, um... Do you think um, you transcend? I'm, I'm always curious about the, the way in which an audience, for example, and I may be doing them a disservice, desperately want some kind of handle to hang on to. And so there's always this process of the simile of saying it's like this or it's like that. But do you think your objects transcend that, that they're more to do with association than, than to be like something, you know, that one can, one can find a shortcut to an awful lot of work by saying, oh, it's like this. I, I have it a lot, you know, where people say, oh, they're, they're like columns. And my retort is that, you, you know, but in, in no way can they be like columns because they can't function as columns or they're phantoms in that respect. And I, I see again, a kind of shared um, experience of, of your work that it can have to, might have to endure the simile of being like something, <laughs> but actually that they're, they're not at all, they are themselves. And yet there's a kind of need to say, oh, this is like bread, or this is like, you know, and then, and then it, instead of what I think the work has the great potential to do is to offer itself up to sensation, to the sentient qualities of what there, you know, the, the warmth of a cold color, you know, the warmth of the whiteness, the, the softness of the round shape, the piling up, which has this, sense of repetition about it and yet each each shape is utterly itself you know that that language is so expansive and generous that the likeness thing tends to shut it down <laughs> um i hope that in the, the need to recognize something as being yes. something known yeah. in the world, mm. that the work could in the end um, transcend that. Yeah. I'm hoping that um, recognizing something 
um, common to something perceived in the world. Um, also, isn't it, it doesn't describe an entity. Mm. It's only entity. Um, um, oh, sorry, I was just, I just did please get about to say something. I just wondered. Veronica, whether it would be, I mean, we're already in very complex territory here now, which is fascinating. But I just wondered whether, on that note, it would be interesting to just go back to the beginning of your career and your student days, because I think there's some parallel, you know, both of you seemed of technology that you wanted to be able to work without the intervention of technology. And it seems to me that um, Phila too, as a student, you know, you were both students at a time of sort of deeply kind of carving technologies or welding technologies, and both of you rejected that pathway. So I suppose my question is, where do, what are the commonalities or what, what, where were you looking to for a, a, a language that you could evolve in your own work? Where were you looking at um, in art history. I mean, you know, uh, Veronica, you have two projects on that relate to Hepworth at the moment. And Philida, you have spoken eloquently about Hepworth in your work. Where are the, the roots of your practice in relation to the kind of, um, you know, the mentors available to you at that time? Veronica, why don't you talk about, you know, the shaping of your work? Right. Um, well, I... I think one of the, I learned to carve at Corsham. Um, I learned um, during your foundation year, which I did at St Albans, you learn all the kinds of structures of disciplines and so on. And at Corsham, they, it was quite a traditional formal um, fine art department where I learned to carve wood, learned to um, uh, make moulds and so on and um, learnt to well, not terribly well, but um, I think really learnt within the structure of learning disciplines, once I got to the Slade, I started to look much more at West African art and votive kind of offerings and bindings. And so I think um, early on, I was beginning to think about um, ways that, kind of moved away from the tradition of sculpture I had learned as an undergraduate student. It seemed to me to be very confining. And also once I left um, art school and I didn't have, you know, um, um, you know, a bench for holding wood and carving and so on, it wasn't a way that I could continue working. And so at the Slade I had, um, tutors, um, uh, primarily Lawrence Gowan and Bill Coldstream, who were both interested in the kind of votive, ritualized kind of structures I was making at the time. And Lawrence Gowan was sort of actively encouraging me to explore that direction in the work. So I think I had he, and sorry, there's a noise outside. I, if you can hear a noise, they're, they're repairing a leak in the ceiling of the building if you're hearing a noise. But so I, I was lucky to have um, um, people around me who encouraged this sort of quite private direction in the work that I actually started, I would work at home and then come into the studio with some of these um, structures made with... Um, um, cinnamon and, um, you know, a lot of natural um, herb-like seeds I was beginning to look at early on at the Slade and binding things up with string and thread. So I, I, I think that um, I had a curiosity about objects which in traditional societies came about through um, with, within a social, a social context. And so I, I think I was making some of these early inquiries, which that was leading me into a different path of making, which was moving me away from a, a kind of tradition of sculpture making that 
was part of my undergraduate training. Mm. And so, I mean, Philida, how does that resonate with you in terms of you finding your kind of escape route from a kind of rather traditional... I think it was much more um, conflicted. It was probably about 10 years before you, Veronica, in the early 60s. And um, I was absolutely fascinated by post-war French sculpture in particular, really, by our standards today, incredibly ugly, ugly work. But I, I loved it. And I then the very traditional work that was going on in Britain at the time, which was very much where landscape meets the figure, which is how I often see Henry Moore, and the whole sort of group of figurative sculptors who had a tremendous command over British sculpture at the time. And I took violently against them and looked much further as field. I was looking at erotic Indian sculpture. And I was also looking at Polish tapestry textile workers, weavers at that time, and looking at decoration. And I think that for me was the equivalent of what you went through. Mm. And then when I left the Slade, I was actually incredibly grateful having been very angry about having to do all this armature building, casting, and really taking each discipline one at a time. And actually Bill Coldstream, you know, asked me whether I wanted to stay or leave the Slade because I think he saw me as such a sort of nightmare. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't, and I don't mean this in any kind of sentimental way, I really didn't have a great deal of support of the Slade <laughs> at that time. And so when I left the Slade, my first objective was to set up studio, a studio and use all those things I'd learned that were really based in clay. That was my primary material. And maybe we, sh we share a sort of common language there, actually, <laughs> and the casting process, which I found fascinating. But I was interested in tools and hand tools and things like that, I must admit. So the studio was and always has been more of a workshop than a, than, than a studio. <laughs> but I think it was really looking beyond the UK that was the inspiration. And of course, the big inspiration was Eva Hesse. And I'm sure we share a, a really common enthusiasm for her. And I, I think for me, I won't go on too much. I think what's always intrigued me about the critical forum around Eva Hesse is that she's treated as a kind of introduction to sculpture. You know, um, you kind of learn about Eva Hesse on your foundation course. You know, you can pour, you can drip, you can cut, you can stretch. And it's almost as if the actual incredible triumph of her work of divesting um, divesting process of its inevitable kind of condemnation to objecthood <laughs> of leaving the state of materiality poised between kind of completion and incompletion. There are so many e extraordinary phenomenological um, I don't know, powerful statements inherent to her work. And in the end, it's quite a small body of work, you know, but all of it, I think, is, is in this limbo between discovering the state of object, the state of space, the state of object and space, and, and a kind of refusal for it to be completely an object. And um, I think for me, that was a, an absolute huge, huge epiphany and revelation about materiality and where the destination of materiality might be. 
Yes, I, I completely agree with you about Eva Hesse. I, um, I first really noticed was Trudeau at Horsham, who was making work just like Eva Hesse and um, was fascinated that he found her work compelling and it was so different to the, the kinds of tradition we were working within at Horsham. Of course, I, I saw, then later saw that show at the White Chapel. I think it was 70, 80. Uh, it was, I think it was the first year at the Slade and it was so wonderful to actually see the work because of course, some of them can't travel yeah. anymore. Yeah. So fragile. But I absolutely love her work and I, I stopped looking at her work for a while because I, I realized how one could internalize somebody um, without any um, conscious intention. One could really internalize somebody else's aesthetic. But, but I was also really fascinated by her refusal um, to make work that was very much part of the, the zeitgeist of her time. She was a woman working within her own realm and her husband at the time was getting a lot more attention than she was but she was working away on her own mm -hmm. um, but I also like the way that um, her emotions were her work was pretty much governed a lot by her emotions and her psychological state of mind and and I, I for me that seemed to differentiate her work quite markedly from the minimalist work around her. And of course she was getting a lot of sympathy and um, support from Donald Judd and um, Sola Witt. Yes. Uh, they, they really admired her and, and encouraged her to pursue her own direction. Um, and I, more recently, I'm aware that, um, you know, with, within, um, visibility, I, I also wasn't aware of an artist like Senge Magudi, whose work I um, first yes. really yes. saw at um, the Henry Moore Institute and, and loved the work. And so I'm also aware that um, some of the artists I, I love and came to know formally mm. were people that were available to me and, yes. and only yes. recently have discovered, oh my goodness, there are these other women artists who I also love and who were not visible. Um, at the same time, Eva Hesse wasn't visible within her. I mean, she got some visibility, but she still wasn't visible in the same way that her minimalist um, male artists were. And so it, the, there's a kind of, um, so along a spectrum, my title, the title of my exhibition sort of revisits lots of different paradigms in, in different um, conversations mm. about these ways that we revisit moments in our own development or my development and reconnect with um, um, not, maybe lost histories, but catching up. Mm. Um, Veronica, just just to, I mean, just just that the lost histories is such a poignant thing in, in in relation to both your careers. Actually, I just think of, you know, you're somebody who had this um, moment of great prominence um, in the uh, late '80s, early '90s, in some really seminal shows. Perhaps, you know, I know you don't want to be, bo you never wanted to be categorized or boxed into a corner, but there was a moment where you were part of a, a really young, dynamic generation of black artists, um, perhaps swept away by the wave of uh, YBAs. But, but, and then you've had really a number of decades where you've been much less visible, but astonishingly kept on working. And I, I often think that an artist's biography is a little bit like an iceberg. You know, you just see in that biography that the, 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 the tip of this huge subterranean or, or you know, structure, which is the studio practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in your case, quite a significant chunk of that studio practice was 
removed by, was destroyed by the Momart fire. And there's a kind of parallel uh, loss, I think, in Philita's work, where for many years, Philita, you, you made and you unmade. Uh, because you had no place to store and no, um, no collectors to buy and neither of you had gallerists to support. So when you filled it, you said you didn't have much support at the Slade and Veronica, all those years in New York with sometimes the promise of an exhibition or but, but the absence of that kind of support, it just seems to be extraordinary um, that you have continued nevertheless to make and, and uh, evolve and, and uh, thrive as artists. How do you deal with the loneliness and loss? Do you want to go, Philippa? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that there's a generational thing here, actually. I think, um, I don't want to go on about the 60s because it's boring when people do, but I think leaving art school in 1966, the main ambition, certainly for myself and my husband Fabian and a few other artists we knew, the main thing we wanted to do was get studios and that sort of defined us as artists and the idea of making work was the ambition, it wasn't the exhibition. So being invisible was not a problem. It was a, a, a fantastic and very disciplined um, experience about how you developed a tenacity for this thing that you couldn't stop wanting to do, even though it appeared to have no value to the rest of the world. It was a solitary endeavor that I certainly had to develop a trust for. And that was, that was tough, you know, because, um, but it was the right kind of tough. It wasn't sort of sobbing on the studio floor kind of tough. It was about really wanting to do something, but that wanting to do was shrouded in all sorts of uncertainty and doubt. And it was just a question of fighting your way out of that maze. And I'm eternally grateful for that time and that it, it gave me a kind of resilience that um, I feel will always be there, kind of come hell or high water, you know. And um, that combined with that very dogged training of casting, welding, you know, woodwork. It, it did, for me, set me up for the journey ahead, I think, greatly. Um, and then, of course, the one big thing is there was a lot of part-time teaching around at that time. It was a new, it was a new idea in a way that art schools would form some kind of patronage for young artists. And I think my generation was incredibly lucky to hit um, that particular spot where a lot of employment was offered and you could actually live off that employment, which you can't now, you know, part-time teaching is not only extremely scarce, but extremely badly paid, you know, so it was, it was a brief window of great good fortune from the 60s through till the early mid 70s. So, so Veronica, 10 years on from Philida really, um, not everything had changed, but it was a different period, wasn't it for you? Uh, yes, it was, um, I was aware that once I, I had this big um, project at, Kettle's Yard and Jesus College. I was a fellow there for a year. And, and then I, um, you know, things started to, to get quiet. And then I was in New York and had two small children. But it wasn't, I was um, quite shocked at that point. I, I thought that all I had to do was just be in a different base for a while. And um, but I, 
I think after the Momart fire, they, they, there just seemed to be this kind of period of collapse. It was also coinciding with the volcano in Montserrat. So there were these multiple collapses. Mm. And, um, and then I wasn't really getting exhibitions. And um, after a period of, you know, some visibility. Um, and so there's a whole period where, although I did a bit of part-time teaching, both uh, I was still doing um, uh, a bit of teaching in England, but um, some teaching in New York, it was a sense of, not been there anymore. Somehow, you know, it, it was about 16 years, in fact, where um, things just was, were practically non-existent. But I think for me, I always had one or two, two, if, as long as you had two people at any given point who had always been supportive in the past, getting in touch, oh, how are you, Veronica, how are things? Um, so that, those years where people checked in on me every now and again were, were really quite important because I did actually become quite unwell and didn't, couldn't function properly because it seemed to go from one extreme to the other. But I, I always remember, um, you know, work with what you've got. So. For a number of years, I've been collecting, you know, paraphernalia, um, uh, fruit trays, vegetable trays from shops and making work. And um, I was sewing and knitting and at one point decided these didn't have to be separate activities. All of these different machinations could come together. And so that, in the end, what happened, and as Philida says, that I, I look back on that whole period as being very valuable because what happened with not getting um, attention was that the work could develop in, in ways that it, it might not have been able yeah. to develop yeah. had I been getting a lot of attention. Yes, I mean, that, I mean, I... It is interesting, isn't it? I remember um, years ago uh, working with Mirosław Balka, a Polish sculptor who we all admire, uh, who like, like both of you had had a very, I suppose, isolated studio practice for many years. And it, it was almost a problem for him when he began, when the commissioning began, hmm. because he moved from a position where he was working, you know, as it were in the dark on his own with, in a kind of studio, iterative studio practice to always working to commission. And I just, so with that in mind, because you are in transition and Philida has transitioned from a studio practice um, shaped by the um, work with what you've got, <laughs> here I am, and up to now chasing commissions and uh, exhibition projects and, you, Veronica, now have, have got, you know, you've got serious interest in your work. How will that change the way you work? Um, well, I um, will continue working with the, the kind of work with what you've got. Um, I will also resume casting some works. Um, I, I think I'm going to combine things much more. Um, I, I think hopefully I have a different kind of freedom in, in terms of possibilities. I just wondered what your relationship to the encounter was, like the, the way you've placed some objects in a recess in the wall, you know, or you've displayed them on these very nice glass tables that are actually very rigorously presented but as objects, they seem to be the opposite in some way. They seem to have a hidden life. I've just read this book by, um, oh God, La Specta. Does anyone know the book? Brazilian mm -hmm. writer from the 1920s. And, and it's about her extraordinary private experience of 
finding herself trapped in a room where she kills a cockroach. And mm. um, it's just an extraordinary, very surrealist book. But in, in a way, your work resonates so powerfully with, with that um, book that these are objects that have had a very different life to the one that we're then offered in our encounter with them. And I wonder what you might, how you might respond to that. <laughs> I, I think that's such a big question and it's very interesting because, um, you know, I, um, I, one of the titles of the works is called um, uh, um, Not a, see, I'm forgetting the title of my work now. Yeah. It really has to do with the idea of, um, not a singularity is actually the title. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Three tables. And it's really talking about the fact that the work isn't about one, one monolithic thing. It can't possibly be. I, I've had, um, I, I feel as though I'm often asked to explain specific meanings for things. And mm. And talking about ideas and thoughts and uh, talked a lot actually and it's interesting that different conversations bring out different um, revelations or um, mm. ways of thinking about the work and so thinking about materiality and ideas and thinking about the fact that actually I have a world view which is how the work gets made. My thoughts and things I read, investigate in some of my thoughts, inner thoughts, then become part of the conversation about how things are made rather than um, a, a specific idea that then is illustrated. And so I've had a, I've been talking quite a lot about, of course, you know, um, how, um, you know, coming from a different, you know, my parents coming from somewhere else. And so I've grown up with a sense of, you know, these parts of myself in multiplicities, which in a way might have something to do with why I move around from different places and always carry bags. But there's something I've internalized about, um, you know, as, a, as an infant perhaps. And so there are all these different dialectics in the work. That is so that when I could talk to 10 people and I will have 10 different things dependent on the kinds of questions that 10 different people ask. But I sometimes feel that, um, you know, perhaps, you know, the, because of somebody else's, um, makeup might want the work to be moving in a in a very specific trajectory and, and my mind doesn't work like that my mind is kind of picking up different resonances and but, um, Francis used a word about associations and I think of the work as associative in terms of different myriad exposure to stimuli that you know I um, I'm exposed to and how that resides in how something comes to be made rather than a singular yeah 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 I, um both of you I mean it, it what you're saying is so resonant about the kind of potency of the of the objects that Veronica makes and um you know it's a, 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 Tony Cragg described sculpture as a thinking object but I think Veronica's Goes beyond Veronica's work goes beyond the thinking object. They're, they're, it's, they're almost unthinking too because they combine idea and metaphor and provocation uh, with great power um, and scale. Um, I think we're going to be joined by Carmen now, who's going to open up to questions from the audience. But thank you both so much. Uh, that is a tip of the iceberg of a conversation that we could continue with for many hours. Thank you, Francis. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to um, the three of you. Actually, that's been really wonderful. 
And um, we do have a few questions from the audience, which I'm just going to uh, read out to you. Um, <clears throat> so question from William Adams and is from Veronica and Philida. And it says, what is your relationship to the ground of the spaces that you show in? And then there's also for Francis, what's your relationship to installing the artist's work on the ground without a plinth? Um, who, who wants to go first? Veronica, we, had a, we have a, a nice anecdote about using the plinth, right, for this exhibition. Um, about removing the plinth. Removing the plinth, yeah. <laughs> we tried the plinth, it didn't work. We, we try to make it more institutional and it just didn't work, right? So it, it, it sat so much better on the floor, right? That that connection really elevated the work to something else, right? Um, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, we tried to make the flint work and it didn't work. It, it just didn't work. But the, the, this work refused. It wasn't even me refusing, the work was itself refusing um, this confinement. And, um... mm. <clears throat> yeah, and Philida, I guess similar relation to the plinth, it doesn't seem to have one, right? I, I think what it is, is gravity. I think gravity is an incredible material in its own right, its physicality, and I I love the way it argues with nearly every action I try and do, you know, gravity is having the pull and push on the work and where gravity collides with something like the floor that fascinates me and in a way what I've done with the plinth I've always uh, kind of made my own plinths as an integral part of, of the smaller works, um, mm. really in a way to kind of integrate that space between the floor and the height at which I want the work to be seen. <laughs> I don't know whether that answers his question or not. <laughs> So I, I think I, just to, to add the incredibly boring curatorial um, third voice, I, I would always go with the artist's preference. And I just, it actually, it's always been inexplicable to me that artists sometimes don't think about whether the work should be on the plinth or on the floor or on a shelf or whatever. It just seems to me that, you know, the, 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 the way an object functions in space, the pull of graffiti or the defiance of it. I mean, think of an artist like Louise Bourgeois who absolutely played on hang, you know, hanging with such mm, a mm, mm. Uh, way of but the suspension. I just, um, I, I think it's incredibly important that, that the object only exists in space in a particular way. And the artist must, that the, 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 positioning in space is, is so integral to our perception of the work. But every now and again, as a curator, it's quite nice to go against the artist and take the work off the plinth and put it on the floor, for example. Um, you know, I love Giacometti on a plinth, but wouldn't it be great to put those heads on the floor? Yes, yes. That is right. Yeah, yeah. what a wonderful idea. Yeah. It's giving yeah. me an idea, actually, now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the scale would change, wouldn't it? Absolutely. It would. We would look down on the work. Yeah. Well, I, I also, um, the pillow landscape earlier works were definitely thinking specifically that the, the works needed their own environment, they needed their own landscape, um, the, the landscape in a kind of interior landscape, but its own actual space to resolve. Yep. Great, wonderful. So let's just move on to another question. Um, this is from Philida. Um, this is from Shari Bull. She said, many of your works have titles with multiple meanings, such as folly and query. Are these titles meant as a guide to meaning or perhaps as a hint at the multiplicity of meanings? And you both touch upon meaning in your work. So perhaps. I find titling work really difficult and I'm incredibly bad at it. Um, sometimes it's sort of fortuitous, like Folly was for the Venice Biennale work and coincided with the folly of Brexit, but also the fact that the actual 
British pavilion is a kind of folly, it's a kind of pretend, it's a, it's a sort of classical Roman villa-esque type building. And um, I felt the two things went together quite well with also the folly of my work, the fact that I like pretense, I like theatricality, and I like the notion of phantom objects, objects that masquerade as something but can't possibly be those things. And um, so it, it, the folly was a word I kept on using about the whole Venice Biennale endeavor. So it just fell into place. And um, Quarry was a bit similar. And um, is it, was it Cherry? Did, did you say her name was Cherry? Cherry. Yes, um, I'm, she's, she's right. I'm interested in the tripping up of multiple, multiple, again, I'll use that word, associations rather than meanings. Maybe I'm very contrary about the notion of ideas and the notions of meanings. And I always want to argue with them and defend art as the great offering where logic and precision can be replaced by a series of approximations that kind of argue with definitive meanings. Um, and so I, I'm interested in titles that maybe allow that imaginative process to happen in some way. <laughs> That's great. Um, Veronica, do you want to comment anything on titles? Um, I know we left a lot of the works untitled and um, well, part of uh, leaving some of the works untitled is, is because groups of works belong to each other. Um, and so how I would have needed much more time to decide if I wanted singular um, objects to have individual titles or whether I was going to keep them as a group. Um, so multiple conversations. Um, I think really defines the whole, um, talks about the meaning, these multiplicity of meanings of the work on the long shelf, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and that I, I try to title work in a way that um, gives some of the clues into the way I've been thinking about the work. Um, so, um, but one of the things that's been quite interesting is that people find some of the titles humorous. And, um, and so whilst that wasn't an, an intention, I like the, the idea of someone else, a curator here in New York said um, that I make light and serious matters. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. The, the idea that, um, you know, perhaps I might have a title that seemed to be quite serious in describing, you, you know, some intentions in the work, but there's also humor there, which um, the, the humor is there in spite of itself. And I find that quite interesting that, mm. that the title could in, indicate some of these different ways of understanding and reading the work. Mm. <clears throat> Oh, now I wanted to ask you another question. Philida. Go for it, Philida. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not just being provocative, but do you think understanding works of art is, is a kind of priority? Or is there another collections of relationships that are in a way more important to that? Is this, is, actually, is this far too big a question? <laughs> It's a big question, yeah. Uh, yes, I, 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 I'm not adverse to the provocation in that question. Um, I think that um, no matter what I say about the work, it, it's always going to have its own private space. Yes, um, yeah. So I, I might say that something's a natural when it might be a pair, um, but in a way, none of that matters ultimately. Mm. Um, you might see an apple and a pear at the same time. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's partly for myself to collect 
my own thoughts that I'm, I'm understanding for myself in certain ways what it is I'm trying to do in this collection. Yes, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, I, I, I suppose I, I, I want a connection with the work. I want, I'm very pleased that people have been connecting with the work at Spike. Mm. Um, it, it, it feels good. Yes, um, yes. Oh God, uh, yes. yes, I can, I can imagine. I'm not denying that. I'm just, um, I suppose I'm at a, at a stage where I'm, I'm fearful of how quickly um, things become academic. You know, the, there's a kind of way of learning about things that is very, you mentioned the word emotional, you know, it's kind of anti-emotional. It's trying to control the language that we would desperately want to use around art and with very good reason, you know, that if one just makes an endless claim for something affecting one emotionally, it becomes vacuous and meaningless. Mm. <laughs> but actually trying to pinpoint what those emotions might be, um, maybe through opposites, maybe through comparisons to other things, I think, I think there's a potential for a new, a different kind of descriptive language to emerge. Um, and I'm, I'm just... I think we're in that place. And I think that's something that resonates with your work for me and something to do with, um, as a student, actually, I remember um, emotions being very, very critiqued, that something, it, it was bad to be talking about one's work in, a, in a, an emotional way. And so to have permission to talk about emotions and to move away from um, a very prescriptive way of working um, is really prescient. And um, as you say, finding different um, ways of communicating a different zeitgeist in thinking about but thinking not in a not in a very constrained way either, but yes, yes. You know, senses and emotional um, resonances. Mm. How to embrace different um, um, conversations, yeah. uh, the different conversations which aren't always verbal. And I think one of the things that's really happened with a lot of these pandemics we're experiencing is how to find the appropriate language to express what this means. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah, very good, yes, yeah. Thank you. Well, that's a very good point. And I think as organizations, institutions, we also play a big part in how we communicate what you bring to the galleries, really. And yeah, that's a conversation that we could continue. Um, but let's just take an, one more question and then we're just gonna have to finish but um, we have Anna Wilson who visited the gallery uh, yesterday and she says Veronica um, I was tempted to touch your work particularly the plaster pillows is the tactile temp temptation intentional how do you both feel about people touching your work <laughs> Veronica <laughs> Um, uh, well, I think I, I enjoy the sensation of wanting to, the tactile sensation of wanting to touch the work. I think one can have that sensation without actually touching it. Mm. Um, mm -mm. I, I like the sense that it evokes that kind of response. Um, and about the pillows, the um, pillows, they... I part of the metaphorical um, thinking about that work or how that work was made was the, the idea that it seems very soft and inviting. Comfort, Frida, you were talking about comfort earlier on. It they so it's a kind of inherent contradiction. It's inviting that as a notion. 
but the contradiction is that they aren't comfortable. You touch it, it's not going to, um, it's not soft, but evoking those particular kinds of sensations um, is an important part of that work. Mm -hmm. I think I think your point about one one of the which I agree with, which is one of the things about not being able to touch is to try and going back to language is trying to arouse a language of what it would be like to touch, you know, might it be cold or might it be hot, that those those things can maybe be stimulated by the not touching. I'm always thinking of um, Mary Toppenheim's um, breakfast mm -hmm. in fur, the fur teacup, and, you know, that sense of, well, it's sort of visceral erotic language, but also if you actually were to drink out of it, um, just imagining that is enough to take one on some fabulous journey. You know, would there be blood in that cup? What what might it be? And I think the way that leads your imagination into quite far reaching corners of one's mind is more interesting than literally handling the object. Um, I, I completely agree, and I remember I was in an exhibition um, that was for, um, uh, at that point it was called for the short, it was about non-sighted people being able to... Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, of course, one had to wear gloves, so the, the sensation of touching works with gloves on wouldn't be the same as touching work with one's yeah. fingertips, yeah, yeah. Um, and children, I, I, I like the idea that children could touch things, um, to generate, um, um, you know, whole world of imagination. But I think adults, as you've just said, I think suspending um, sensations and suspending one's imagination is, is more important because the actual touch and isn't going to reveal mm. anything. Mm. It's not, the actual touch and isn't necessarily going to reveal more about the thing that's there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> isn't, isn't the same, isn't there a sort of parallel with the, with, with, with holding of meaning that to title a work or to say this is what it is actually denies the viewer the, the 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 opportunity to to use their imagination to fantasize to occupy that space you know the work of art in a way is like the wardrobe into narnia and that's what it does it transitions you into a, a completely different experience i loved um uh Fyrida, you know when you talk about that that it has to be a world without definitive meanings mm. because otherwise what is the point of art it's the only space left to us where we can coexist with kind of deep existential uncertainty Absolutely. And, and live through that. Mm. And that maybe, you know, it can be, it can be enjoyed and it can be despised, you know, to be uncertain is okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> As I think we've all realized in the last 18 months. <laughs> In, well, not necessarily okay, but it is a, a state of existence, you know, that, that one be can become resilient to in some way, you know. Yes, I like this word uncertainty because we are in this uncertain, uh, not only moment, we've always been... Uh, exactly, yes. <laughs> I mean, once you're not a, a baby anymore and you become conscious of the world around you, mm. you're all li living with these different states of uncertainty. Mm. And I like, like might not be the right word, but to be able to experience that in work without something being very subscribed, um, for me is, I, I'm really, you know, the whole 
I feel as though part of what's happened and people looking at my work again probably is to do with materiality and how one is experiencing um, the physical world through, you, you know, the sensation of made things. Mm. Um, and so, you, you know, this is really a, a very tremendous moment. Um, mm having these very different kinds of um, existential conversations, which really impacts all of our lives in different ways. Um, you know, culturally, um, economically, and so on, we're, we're all impacted in, in, in different ways that there's a shared commonality. Um, and, and so, um, you know, uh, that could lead us into different conversations. Of course, we don't have time to take on everything, but the, the way that we are all interconnected and that we are we share sensations that are, are common to all of our experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, how we, part of that is how we learn to respond to our sensations. <laughs> Exactly. Thank you, Veronica. And I think that's a really nice way to kind of end this conversation and, you know, hope that there will be more conversations about these in less uncertain times, maybe, who knows. So um, I would just like to thank you very much for joining us tonight. And um, thank you also to um, the Freelance Foundation for their support and thanks to my colleagues, Rosa Tyhurst and Jane Farron for making this event possible. Obviously, thank you very much to Philida, Veronica, Francis for your generosity tonight and for sharing all these things, um, all these conversations. And finally, just a reminder that you can visit Veronica Ryan's exhibition in our galleries until September the 5th. Uh, please, please check our website for opening times and please take a look at our website for more upcoming events. Um, we look forward to seeing you again. Yeah. Um, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felida. Thank, thank you. you, Veronica. Lovely to speak with thank you. Thank you both. <laughs>